Hey, uh, reminder again, uh, we are recording. Um, so uh, I, I titled the proposal in fixed bang because the thing that's most in your face is the syntax. Uh, uh, but really, it's about the semantics of what we're proposing, uh, the core of which is a new extension point for the existing promises uh, that enable us to return to our earlier goals of turning JavaScript into a distributed programming language. Um, and this is uh, also something that we have working through shims. Uh, so for example, uh, this is our, um, uh, this is an interaction through our console uh, with the demo that we're running on our blockchain where, the, um, where we have uh, SES code running on a local machine, talking to SES code running on a blockchain, uh, and it's talking, and as you see that use the infix bang syntax uh, to send a message uh, from the local machine to an object that was running on the blockchain. Um, uh, we're not advocating any particular remote object system. We're not even actually advocating remote object system. What we're advocating is um, some, some changes to the language to make it possible to use promises for, for more of the original purposes that we designed our promises for, that we designed our promises for, uh, that, um, yeah, um, uh, that we're now trying to get back to. So uh, let's recap some of the history. How did we get to ECMAScript 6 promises? Those promises are essentially built uh, uh, almost completely out of the behavior of then. Everything else is kind of decoration around the behavior of then. Uh, and then was in the initial conception that led to ECMAScript promises, then was, was one of several features and was not the central feature. So to recap some of the history, um, uh, several of us uh, were associated with a research language um, in the late 90s and early 2000s called E and a network protocol for distributed objects called CAPTP. Uh, and we did a, we found it very pleasant to write distributed applications spread across mutually suspicious machines uh, using this paradigm, starting with uh, electric communities, habitats, uh, chips creation, uh, which was a distributed uh, virtual world, uh, second life like the Federated. Um, so, so this was turned out to be very pleasant. Uh, Waterkin uh, uh, brought this to both uh, Java and JavaScript um, and was used inside HP, including uh, at scale. Um, and uh, as part of that, uh, Tyler Close created the original uh, uh, Q JavaScript API. Uh, that Q JavaScript API led to the work by uh, Chris Kowal and Dominic Dancola uh, on the current Q API uh, that, um, that really directly inspired uh, the JavaScript promises. Uh, and uh, I made a, uh, the original promise proposal uh, goes back to 2011 um, uh, that was very much trying to follow the pattern uh, of Q with respect to concretely how the power of the E system was presented. Uh, now the reason why I colored the things that I have colored in white is uh, these promises were promises designed to support distributed object computing. They did support distributed object computing. Um, uh, and they did it with a feature called Promise Pipelining that I'll be coming back to explain. Uh, Q Connection was the extension of Q that was built to do distributed objects. Uh, it successfully did that over a post message within the browser, uh, over XHR between a browser and a server. Um, uh, I think it, it also had a version that could use uh, web sockets as a transport, I don't remember. Uh, but the reason I colored it yellow is in the absence of weak references, it's not practical. In the absence of weak references, 
what you have to do to do distributed objects on top of JavaScript ends up leaking distributed garbage very, very quickly. So that's essentially why now is the time to revive the rest of this, is because, um, because of the return of leap references. Um, Dean went off to Microsoft to do the Midori project, which is uh, uh, essentially the same computational model uh, in a variant of C-sharp they called M-sharp. Uh, they used it at scale. It had promised pipelining. And Dean reports that um, uh, they measure in switching from a Midori without promised pipelining to one with promised pipelining, uh, they, they saw as much as a factor of 100 speed up, which is way more than I ever expected. So promise pipelining is, is a big deal and it might be, it seems like it's even a bigger deal than I expected. There is another branch um, uh, of twisted Python and fool's cap that was using deferreds uh, and also uh, distributed objects, uh, distributed capabilities based objects. Um, and, but that one misunderstood the e-promise design and their deferreds didn't support pipelining uh, that led to some derived work that ended up being a dead end, so we could remove that. Uh, and Cap and Proto, yeah. We also, totally separate branch, which you may not be aware of, we built a large scale secure enterprise security management system in Sun that showed similar performance. Yes, uh, there are several systems that I didn't mention, but they don't directly lead uh, forward. But, but, but yeah, it's worth mentioning that this computation model is known to work well and that many instantiations, uh, or leans at Microsoft was another one that, that was, used, was specifically built to enable large scale services uh, and did work quite well at scale. Um, uh, ambient talk, uh, Pam von Kutzum did an academic language uh, on which they're still building and extending uh, in academic work, especially in Belgium. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, the reason there's many reasons why um, people want weak references. Uh, the weak ref proposal, uh, Dean and I are two of the co-champions, um, and the reason why we pushed on it is because support for distributed object computing is the use case that, that, that we are, uh, care most about. It's the one that we're actually using in our product right now. Um, so that plus the infix bank proposal I'm about to explain, to explain uh, these elements together lead to a very pleasant ability, the ability to create a very pleasant distributed JavaScript. Again, I'm not proposing the distributed JavaScript, I'm proposing the hooks that enable people to build their own distributed JavaScript by composing these hooks. And I want to emphasize that the Q library in particular, um, uh, I went to uh, NPM uh, just uh, like two days ago to prepare for this talk, and I took this screen, sh screen snapshot. Uh, so NPM, even though as far as I can tell, it hasn't been updated in like two years, uh, continues to have, I mean, this has seven million weekly downloads. I don't, I'm not sure if that really means what it sounds like it means. I don't, but, um, but clearly, uh, Q library, with the things that it has in promises beyond platform promises, continues to be used years after platform promises have been introduced. <laughs> so, and this example is a good way to understand why promise pipelining is such a big deal. Uh, let's say that disk is a local promise for a remote object representing a disk with directories. You use the bank syntax to send it the message open directory. The way to interpret bank is bank is like dot, but where dot does an immediate invocation on an object it must be an object, not a promise for an object, it must be local. Bang does an eventual send. That's our terminology, immediate call versus eventual send. So uh, every place where you could write a dot, if you put a bang there instead, you can do it. Um, you, can, you can 
basically still invoke the open directory method on the remote object with the argument foo. Without pipelining, um, uh, this expression would, would be three round trips. One round trip, you go to the remote disk and ask it for a file object. It would be a remote file object created by the remote directory object. The, the bang expression immediately gives you back a promise for the result, but it's an unresolved promise since you don't know the result yet. You don't yet know even whether there will be a successful result or an exception. So without pipeline, you would wait for that round trip before you had something you could send the open file message to. Uh, and uh, then likewise, when you want to read the open file, that would be three round trips. With pipelining, you can send all three off with zero round trips. Of course, you don't get back an answer uh, until the round trip completes. But this means that in formulating a request, you can do fairly deep functional composition without paying for round trips on a per, on a per request basis. And, um, and uh, all the projects have benefited tremendously by, by this pipelining. Uh, and it's because of our need to support the pipelining, which is why we need an extension point of promises. <laughs> so, uh, so to explain how pipelining actually works, Let's first introduce a visual language to explain what, what, would what would happen if we were doing a conventional blocking RPC. So this is more than just conventional RPC. This is hypothetical conventional RPC if JavaScript was a language that did blocking. Uh, so just to see what's going on, we're evaluating the expression at the top, which is obviously equivalent to the three statements below it. Uh, so in the first statement, we would send the uh, the a uh, the a the a message to the object x uh, and uh, t1 is the variable that will hold the result but the, but it's not until uh, a gets delivered to t1 and t1 returns I'm sorry delivered to x and x returns a new object t1 it's not until that happens that we actually have a T1 object to send a message to. Likewise with B, getting to Y, creating a T2 object. And uh, now this is the final step in the animation uh, that's interesting, um, which is these, now that we've got T1 and T2, we're able to send the C message to T1 with T2 as an argument because uh, we can name both T1 and T2 in order to send the messages, uh, and we name the result T3. The best you can do without a new hook uh, is whether you do it with a manually with a then pattern or you do it with an await pattern. Um, uh, uh, this await pattern is is, is essentially the best you can do if you're trying to do this somehow purely within the constraints of current JavaScript. Uh, and the key thing to focus on here uh, is uh, the P1 is, um, is a promise for a remote object. Uh, on the third line, you're awaiting on P1 before you can send the C. Not until the P1 promise resolves uh, can the then clause fire? And not until the then clause fires can you um, have something on which you can invoke the C method in order to convey a message to what P1 designates. So in JavaScript today, this same diagram is approximately the best you can do. With the infix bang sequence, uh, what we can do instead is while the A message is still in the air before it is landed, we already have a pro an unresolved promise for what the result of uh, x dot A will be. Um, so we can already name the, re the, the result prior to having the result. And likewise, of course, with, uh, with the B message sent to Y, and since we can name 
both of those results, we can uh, we can proceed to send the C message to whatever P1 will designate uh, using as an argument whatever P2 will designate. If P1, if the operation, the A operation on X throws an exception rather than returning a value, then P1 becomes a rejected promise. That's as we would expect. Uh, if P1 becomes a rejected promise by the bank semantics, uh, C never gets delivered anywhere, and P3 also becomes a rejected promise, and that's exactly the propagation of rejection that you expect from the existing then semantics. So this is what it looks like in Q as written today, uh, which is uh, we have this, um, uh, we add to promise.prototype a uh, set of methods, I'm showing here the post message, um, uh, and the post message is how you do a, a eventual invocation. Uh, and in order to uh, write this manually, you have to manually state what the method name is, you have to manually provide the list of arguments, and it's really terribly verbose and unpleasant. And as the statistics on Q show, people do this if this is the only choice. But given the strong analogy between dot and bang in terms of what you think about what's going on, uh, giving syntactic sugar to this makes the program experience very pleasant, and we're experiencing that. The expansion of bang actually always does a promise resolve on the left argument, and then invokes one of these methods on what is now guaranteed to be a genuine promise. The promise.resolve um, guarantees that its output, if successful, is a genuine promise. And it guarantees that no matter what the operand is, it will not cause code that, that it provides to get run immediately. So by the bank syntax is also protection against reentrances. If the operands on both the left and right of the bang are, are, are untrusted operands, you can nevertheless go ahead and invoke them knowing they can't execute code during the current turn. Everything they might do, whether local or remote, will happen after this turn is complete. So there's um, the same kind of, we're leveraging the protection that we already designed into uh, both resolve and then. And as shown here, uh, the, there's essentially four operations that we do with dot, uh, which is uh, invocation, um, uh, uh, getting a property, setting a property, and deleting a property. Um, uh, and uh, uh, what Q has uh, is uh, an API that supports each of them. Uh, and the original 2011 proposal proposed the bank syntax for each of them. Experience since then, my experience, our experience at Agoric, uh, is that really only invocation and get are useful. I don't think I've ever written or seen code that actually makes use of a remote put or a remote delete. So if those don't survive the, the process, I'm completely calm about that. The object that you're doing the bang to, and which he sugars into that syntax, into a call to those methods on promise prototype, uh, if the designated object, if the object that the promise is a promise for is local, then it just turns into the things in the column in the middle. So um, you know, many people react to the, to, you know, to the, to the bank proposal is, why don't you just do, and then they'll show us the code in the, in the column in the middle, and the reason is the column in the middle, for reasons I've explained, cannot support promise pipelines because the then can't fire until the promise is resolved. So if it's a handled promise, uh, a promise created through our extension point, then those same methods on promise prototype instead invoke the uh, methods on the corresponding handler shown on the right. So the philosophy here is similar to proxies, which is you, cre you create a handled promise by providing a handler, um, and then various operations on the promise are then lifted 
into invoking traps on the handler. Um, uh, these method names on the handler come from the original Q, Q API from Tyler Close, uh, and that was uh, motivated uh, for Tyler by uh, Tyler's major use case in Waterkin was he actually turned these into HTTPS restful, method, restful uh, XHR invocations uh, to restful JSON services. Um, I'm completely calm about changing the names both on the left and the right. I only care here about the semantics. Likewise, I'm, I'm, I'm calm about the infix bang syntax. In fact, it has a conflict with TypeScript, so we know the infix bang syntax uh, is not going to survive. Uh, it's not, even though there's no, even though in theory we could proceed to standardize it anyway, I think we're all agreed that uh, we'd rather avoid a conflict with that use in TypeScript. Um, this is the entirety of the new hook that we propose. A static method on the promise class called make handle, um, which looks on purpose a lot like the promise constructor. The first argument is a function that then gets called back to with a resolve function and a reject function. Uh, but we have this additional argument, which is the unresolved handler. This makes an unresolved, until resolve or reject is called, this makes an unresolved promise as you'd expect. But, and it's then that it is identical to what it is today. This, this extension does not touch the behavior of then. So all the existing behavior of promises, there's nothing in this proposal that even touches the existing behavior. So there's not there's not even a risk of breaking upwards compatibility. Mark, you're already bringing up in this your um, handbook. Ah, okay. And there's so, a lot in the queue. Ah, okay. So the, that's the unresolved handler, um, uh, and then the resolve function that gets passed there if it's called with a resol a fulfillment and not a non venable and the handler, that, then the fulfillment can be a local standard for a remote object, and that's the resolved handler that then handles those methods for further things. And uh, abstract syntax, uh, concrete syntax, uh, pending uh, Waldemar's reaction. Uh, and uh, we also uh, already know that uh, we need to uh, see how this composes with optional chain. Uh, which is not shown here, and those are the URLs, and I'm ready to take questions after I turn off recording.